start um, session five, and we'll. I think we've talked about the fact we're going to cover hematology and shock for sure. I may wait on burns. I may start. I still have a few things left, like we hadn't done hepatitis, I don't think. Uh, nutrition or diabetes, and I really need to hit diabetes heavy. So, um, let me, let's first do our plug for wit. And Laurie watched it. Well, the movie I asked you to watch, I sometime watch it. It's just uh, very makes you self aware. And she says it's HBO as well as uh, Netflix wit. But you would just become mm -hmm. her. Um, it's in the bed. It feels so long, but that's the point because she's just sitting there in the bed going through cancer treatments with no visitors, no, no, and she's very intellectual. She's a professor, and they want you to feel that way because you're going through it with her basically, and it's just long nights and long days, and the doctors just coming in and ripping covers off, and I'm gonna do it, you know, like start doing a pelvic exam without even saying anything, just you know, and. Um, then she's talking to you, like, well, you know, they come in and use these words, always look them up, and, yeah. And ask how I am, but I'm really not, she's not listening. I just told her I'm, I'm terrible, but she is. Right, she's like, the best is when someone asks you, so how are you today, or how are you feeling when you're actively vomiting? <laughs> uh -huh. I'm like, uh -huh. not good. <laughs> <laughs> There's that, and then um, Linda brought up the site rn.com and she says rn.com and then tit tat toe she thinks that's awfully good on the blood gases if you've got the blood gases down that's fine but if you would like a little more brush up she suggests that i'm going to look at it too because she thought it was helpful and anything else, anybody, next session, next Sunday is demonstration. And then after that's burns and immunology, I think, and something else. But I do have some leftover stuff, like I told you, hepatitis, calcium, I mean cancer, nutrition, and diabetes. Mm -hmm. So let's go on and start. And if you've watched the video the youtube on hematology it's not too long is it um, no. oh is it that long <coughs> yeah shocking really long. so hematology the study of blood and and you know and so this is kind of a review but it's kind of good repetition is always good i think for people for me so uh, with the blood we've got cells and plasma and the cells are white red and platelets and um, red is the one that carries all our nutrients and our oxygen white fights it's going to be our fighting cell for us and then of course platelets are for clotting and and they um, and, and so they have characteristics and and one is the length of their life red lives 120 days and um, so four months before it dies and then uh, white is interesting it lives as long as it ha has to kind of if you've got an infection it's right there and producing fast as it can and dies off fast and produces fast so the definition is that white lives days weeks months years that they can live, the white cells. They're used up and replaced quickly, and of course, all of it is, is um, made in the bone marrow, with some uh, red cells made in the, in the kidneys. The, yeah. um, pl uh, platelets live 10 days, and so, um, and if we get a transfusion, like we talked about last week, um, platelets last 24 hours in a transfusion. Well, then why bother? Because if your platelets are below 10,000, you could just be sitting listening to me and pop a blood vessel and bleed to death. 
uh, if they're 10,000, because we want the 100, 150,000 to 450,000. So if you're down at 10, 24 hours might make a difference. That may, we may be waiting for the bone marrow. Have, chemo may have happened. It's destroyed or damaged bone marrow from trying to produce cancer cells or leukemic cells. So 24 hours may mean a lot. So that's the life of those three. Um, you know, they're all just equally as important, but of course the red is what carries so much of our life but we can't very well do without the white to fight off things, and we sure can't live without clotting. Um, so here's the blood, and um, um, uh, cells are 45% uh, of our blood, and plasma is 55%. And so we've talked about the cells, the 45%, but the 55% is made of that 55%, 98% water. So there's where you've got to stay hydrated as well. You know, we've already talked about water, water, hydration. Americans just don't do it, and it just drives me crazy. And um, the not drinking enough water. We've already talked, we use a pint. That's a pint. That's not even a half a pint. That's uh, two cups just to keep our nasal respiratory system moist. Now we've got blood that 98% of plasma is water. So what else is in plasma? It's got the water, but then it's got um, albumin. And I think I've, I've touched on some of this similar stuff these five weeks, four weeks. But albumin and it's the, the biggest protein, I think I mentioned that, our biggest protein in our body that helps with um, um, uh, not osmosis, what's the word? Osmotic. I had, well, yeah, the osmotic pressure between cell membrane. And it's the albumin that allows the diffusion the integrity of diffusion, or profusion, I guess I should say. And it's, it's albumin that allows that. And um, so if our albumin is down, we don't profuse through our cell membrane as well. So I, I think it's such a hidden, secret, um, vital part of our life is our albumin, mm -hmm. part of plasma. And then um, gamma globulin, which is antibodies. And so we've got our um, ready-made, some we've made. And uh, then, of course, we've got, um, we were born with them. We've made some. Our, our mother gave us some, but they don't really last more than about four months, the ones from our mothers gave us. Uh, our immunization, and we'll talk more about immunology because I don't have a YouTube on that, but immunology, we'll talk about the immune system and um, how incredible that is with our antigen and antibodies. So gamma globulin are our antibodies that we're already equipped with or we've made. And I think I told you, I think I did, but I'll just say it again. Once we've made our antibodies, they're there. Um, and, and if you got injured and were bleeding on the highway, um, antibodies go and hide. They don't let themselves go on the pavement. So they go, I think of an ostrich, they go and hide, in, some say in the bone marrow, but the point is that, and I may have already said, when Dolly, Dottie West, the Country Music Center. What was she on the way to the Opry and had a wreck, or late, and a man picked her up to help her and had a wreck and <clears throat> lacerated at least her liver and other things. And she was in the hospital and the 
the Tennessean said she's been transfused three times her normal blood. Well, if we're going we'll talk about how much that was, but it was three later. You and I have 10 units of blood. Is that right? 10 units? Or is it 10? Oh, five, five quarts is, ten, is five quarts of blood in our body. Five, five huh? On your video, you said five liters or 10 pints. Yeah, okay. that's what I want to say. Thank you. Five liters or quarts, because it's close, liter and quart. So five liters or five quarts of blood, and each quart has two pints, and a pint is a liter. I mean, a pint is a unit. So we've got 10 units of blood or 10 pints of blood, five quarts or five liters. And so if we did the math on Dottie West, if she had three times, had been transfused three times her body, then she had 30, she was transfused with 30 units of blood. Later, the paper said she was transfused with 33 units. She died in case you didn't remember that, that little um, tidbit. Anyway, so you and I are walking around with that much blood. Um, uh, 10 pints of blood, I mean 10 units, um, or pints, five quarts or five liters. Um, now, uh, so gamma glob, okay, so my point was that if Dottie West had, re had uh, lived, and she had that many transfusions and that much loss of blood. Obviously, she was losing her blood that they were transfusing. She would have still been immune to everything she was immune to because the antibodies stay hidden, which is just remarkable to me. And um, so, there we are at plasma, water, gamma globulin, albumin, and fibrinogen. And fibrinogen helps us clot. That's the best way to just put it. Um, if you don't have fibrinogen, you're not going to clot. You may have some platelets, but it's not going to work together. And if anybody gets fibrinogen, it, I mean, if anybody gets plasma, and that's, we talked about it last week, fresh frozen plasma or plasma, if a patient's getting plasma, why are they getting it? Well, they're not getting it for the water. They're not getting it for gamma globulin. We can give that by itself. Albumin, we can give that by itself in an IV. So they must be getting it for fibrinogen, which is usually the reason they get plasma. <clears throat> so that will potentiate their uh, clotting. Uh, and of course, you, just to remind you of the names of them, the red cells are erythrocytes, white cells, leukocytes, and the um, platelets are thrombocytes. And I want you to realize on hematocrit and hemoglobin, I, I just, I gave you a card, but I just memorized 40 for hematocrit, 40. And that's what I want. That's what I, I want you to have. And I told you hemoglobin is a third of it. So if you're healthy. So it's uh, for a 40, it's about a 13 would be your hematocrit. Now, what I want you to understand is that is a ratio of hematocrit and hemoglobin. And, and I think I may have already told you, but I can't remember. To me, um, <clears throat> hematocrit is are the cells and the deliverant the, the the matter that matters in a red cell is the hematocrit. If you look up hemoglobin, it says the ox the fancy it's the oxygen carrying capacity. So I think well, it's fluid. Now don't tell a physiologist. Hemoglobin's fluid because it's not, it's 
the oxygen carrying capacity, whatever. So in my visual, hematocrit is sediment, great stuff, oxygen, nutrients, and hemoglobin gets it there. So if that's true, if I take uh, some blood from you, or, or let's say you have a wreck and you're bleeding on, in the pavement, and you get to the emergency room and they take your, a sample of your blood, you understand your hematocrit's gonna be great still because they took a sample that is still proportionate. You didn't lose, you lost whole blood. You didn't now, and I think I've brought out where a burn, you lose so much fluid with a burn. So the hematocrit and hemoglobin, the hemoglobin will probably be, well, you'll, you've lost a lot of, but red cells don't all pop with burns. But in a burn, you may, the proportion is that an entirely different one third because you still may have the red cells, but the, but the oxygen carrying capacity uh, evaporate. You can say the plasma evaporates too. But anyway, I want you to realize initially blood will be fine if somebody's lost a lot. It's because the hematocrit hemoglobin is a proportion. And you lost blood on the pavement, but it was the whole deal. And the whole deal is still in your body as far as that proportion. Not the, not the five liters. We're way down on that. But the hematocrit hemoglobin, the comparison is still good. Um, I think I told you the other day when we looked at labs that PCV, packed cell volume, they call hematocrit. Some still call it that. Um, then, um, and we are primarily making uh, in the, we make, I told you, in the bone marrow mostly blood's made, but uh, some is made in the liver. And of course we know uh, the kidneys do make the red cells. Spleen makes a little bit. In the long run, eventually, you and I, we're probably only making it in large numbers in our bone marrow. Still some in our kidney, kidneys. Um, now, we've already gone over test some, but um, I think I mentioned when we were doing labs that complete lab work, we talked about complete blood work, CBC, was hematocrit hemoglobin white and maybe platelets red. And, and um, we went over norms. You remember, I want 40 for the hematocrit. I want um, 4,000 to 5,000. I mean, 5,000 to 10,000 for white and platelets 100, 150,000 to 450,000. Red, you notice I didn't say red, but I just always remember 4,000. Um, now, the, so the red, about what I wanna say on that, just remember, and I'll bring it up again on diabetes, the red lives 120 days so sugar, you can't fool it. Sugar loves it and sticks to it. And some creative, wonderful scientists realized that if we check this red cell and see how much sugar is sticking, we'll know how good a diabetic they have been compliant as far as diet. And so that's your hemoglobin, H1, it's H1C. Some people just call it 1C or A1C. But it's A1C or HA1C, and it's the sugar that sticks to the red cell. 
So every three months, a physician or physicians watching the compliance of a diabetic or why they can't ever get them regulated, they can sure look at a H1AC and see how compliant diet-wise they've been because there's no teasing on that. The cell doesn't lie. And so they check it every three because they know that cell's going to be dead in, an, in a month. I mean, excuse me, yeah, every three months. So they check it every three, that cell has one more month to live. So they do, they do that rather than every four, so they catch the best results. So the H1AC, uh, so that that's what I wanna say on the red. The white, we know fights, and so, um, there are five different ones of them, and the five uh, are um, the easiest of all is is the basophils, and they indicate a blood dyscrasia, and you, you don't have to memorize the norms of them; it'll always be there for you. But if basophils are high you probably have a blood problem, um, leukemia or something, a blood dyscrasia. If um, eosinophils, so the five are, well, are they, do, are they, yes, they are in, let's go, let's go to them. They're in, let's look at page four in the agenda. It may be there, I'm not sure. Um, no, it's not four, is it? It's at the bottom. What? It is. Is it in the agenda? Mm -hmm. Well, then my page four is gone, I guess. Let me see. Yeah, and I saw it a minute ago. All right. All right, do you see white blood cells? And the layer very bottom is basophils. So, um... Then go, that's what I wanted you to look at. So then, um, that's a, what's our next, lymphocytes? Uh, eosinophils. And they indicate uh, an allergy. An allergy. And so if, if you have high blood cells, white blood cells, we want five to 10,000, you've got eight or 10 and you feel miserable, the physician might, um, now, what, I know I've got it somewhere. Um, the physician would then look at your differential, that's the difference in those five, and sees that eosinophils are high, oh, you've got an allergy. And so that indicates that. Then the next one's lymphocytes, and it in, indicates a virus. So, you know, you might say, why doesn't a physician always do a differential so we know whether to give an antibiotic or not? They just don't, um, unless there's a question. There's no reason to do a differential when you tell me your, you, your stomach hurts and your urine's cloudy. Then we're pretty sure it's a bacteria and so not a virus. So they don't need to do it, differentials. So they try to be prudent in their decisions of one more test to see if they need to run. A di you can, one time I was with a physician in emergency room and the miserable patient, two weeks of coughing and spitting and sputing, and he put his stethoscope right on her, her lungs and said, well, she's got pneumonia, but I don't know if it's viral or bacterial. So he had to do a, a differential. So um, the lymphocytes will be elevated. Again, I don't make you learn or ask you because I don't know the norms. Then monocytes are the big question mark. Nobody says, does it say? Nobody even knows. No. But all literature on monocytes say, we don't really know what they do. We know they help the other five. They clean up. We know they do that, 
But as far as attack, one thing, there's no decision that they do that. So they help out, clean up, which leaves only the fifth one, which is neutrophils. And neutrophils have uh, several names, and they're adult <coughs> fighting bacterial cells. The adult, they are adults, and they're fighting bacteria only. And they also go under the names of SEGS, segmented neutrophils, uh, polysegmented neutrophils, or polysegs, or neutrophils, polysegs, SEGS, and, and just polymorphs. Segmented SEGS, polysegs, polymorphs. Mm -hmm. No matter what facility you're in, they may use one of those terms, but what they're really just saying is it's bacterial fighting white cell. It's the only one of the five that has a growth pattern, a, a maturation pattern. All the others are born out of the bone marrow ready. These are born young, I say babies, they grow to teenagers and then to these adults. So therein is where the stabs, bands, jubes come in. And so the youngest of all bacterial fighting are the jubes, no, are jubes the, the babies. Mm -hmm. And they not working for us. They will, because they're gonna mature. And they mature as fast as they need to mature. And so they're the youngest. The next is a ba bands <coughs> or stabs, and it's whichever facility you're in, whether they call them stabs or bands. And they're not working yet either until they become neutrophil six, poly six, polymorphs. And they'll grow up, and it, as we, I don't, we don't know, maybe minutes, maybe days, whoever however much they're needed, they mature fast. They say that you can, I, I may have told you this, white cell transfusions never have given, never have seen it. Check periodically to see if they're even still giving them because we talked about blood transfusions of whole. When you get a transfusion on my floor, you're getting just the red cells. And, uh, you get platelets, but I've never given white. But they tell me it is still out there. Some hospitals at the end of the hall have recliners and they take my blood out, centrifuge, give it back to me and give Chris the white cells. And by the time he and I are through that white cell transfusion, I have more white cells than when I started because the body got the word, the bone marrow started pouring them out and maturing them. Is that not just craziness? Mm -hmm. So it gives you an idea of the life and the activity of the white cell. Um, why do we need, why did the creator do this baby, teenager, adult with the bacterial? But it's quite helpful in how far a bacterial issue has gone. So, follow me. If a physician's asked a differential and the hospital facility, if they don't give you a younger one, they're saying it doesn't matter. But they'll give you one of the younger, be it bands or juves or stabs, they'll give you one younger and always will show you the adult. Now follow. If the adult are normal, and I'm going by the, the norm that the lab work sends back, not from your memory, but, oh, my white blood cells, neutrophils are normal, but my, my stabs are raised just off the roof. It means the infection's just started and sent word to the bone marrow, we've got a problem, 
Houston. You've got to get some white cells made fast. So the white cells are just ready to mature, but they can't just pop up and be mature. They've got to grow. So that tells a healthcare giver, this infection just started. It's bacterial and it just started. It's a great thing that we have in our body doing for us. And then, um, let's say these are outrageous. The top, the neutrophils are just off the, but Jews are normal. Then it's being resolved. The body said, you've sent enough. You can go back to normal production because we've got it covered. Isn't that wonderful? So now let's say both are just in so high. Young and old are just raging. We're ray in the middle of a raging infection because they're making them still and we still, it's not enough, so they're making more. So it's, it's the white cells are well, wonderful too. We're pretty lucky. So then that's the story of the white cells. Then um, um, red uh, platelets. Um, there's not much else to tell you. I want you know we want 150 to 450 thousand of them. We've already talked about transfusions of platelets, um, and um, their life is 10 days unless you're transfused, which is 24 hours. Um, um, let's talk about some conditions that happen in um, with these with the cells with cell problems and um, with the red of course the most common is anemias and And anemia is only red. You're not low in anything else. You're you're low in red. And um, of the anemias, I think um, iron deficiency is the most common, and it's the one that we can. Um, it's the one that's um, dictated by diet iron deficiency. Um, and, and so people need to iron, iron rich foods and we know that uh, any dried fruit is high in iron. Uh, egg yolks, dried beans and meat have iron. Um, And we, I hadn't had a little session with you on nutrition, but iron doesn't have to have vitamin C to kick it into gear. It can make it without it, but it does so much but better if vitamin C kicks it. And so the statement is, um, vitamin C doesn't need iron, but iron needs vitamin C. And vitamin C, our best, um, vitamin C is the uh, red pepper, red, not the hot pepper, but the red bell pepper is your best vitamin C. Citrus, everybody thinks citrus, and citrus is good in vitamin C, but it's about five down on the list of, of most efficient. Um, uh, the fruit, guava. It's high in, in um, C. Um, so, to absorb iron, uh, vitamin C really does help us do that. The anemia that, not most of the other anemias do not have to do with diet. Um, one of the, one that certainly doesn't is sickle cell where the red cell, instead of being round, is like a sickle. 
and uh, they say it was a, um, an adaptation, a mutation with, you know, it's mostly among African Americans and that it's a mutation from when they were so exposed to malaria, the body, body realized if it made that red cell out shape different, <coughs> the malaria um, germ, <coughs> the malaria whatever, would not attack it. And so it was a protection, but the trouble is it's still doing it. We don't have malaria and uh, it's not holding the nutrients and doing doing the proper um, nutrition to our bodies. The best, the worst thing about the sickle cell is that, and this is the best thing about our cells, they go through our vascular system in the blood, our cells, when they get to the very end, when they go into a capillary and it dump the nutrition and the oxygen into the tissue and keep going, but their load is now the waste from the from this um, tissue. And, and, and so I always think it's just a train, visualize a train who finally goes into a tunnel and releases its cargo and picks up the waste and goes on. Because we know capillaries don't end, they just keep on going, but they, the blood is done its due in that tunnel. Well, if you've got a box car uh, in the train that is the shape of a sickle, it can't go through the tunnel so well, so it sticks. And when it sticks, the oxygen got off, but it doesn't have that good give and take. So when tissue, what, what is pain? Pain is lack of oxygen to tissue. So when tissue's not getting the, the uh, oxygen, it's enormous pain. And so that's with sickle cell, one of the biggest things is pain. And it's simply because that oxygen is not getting the tissue because the cell's stuck. And, and so what I've told you already is two things about sickle cell, pain, and you need enormous flow of fluid to kind of push that sickle through the tunnel. And so if you ever take care of sickle cell, they're on 150 to 200 milliliters an hour just to keep pushing that fluid through there. Um, and then, so a sickle cell patient needs pain medication, they need um, high fluid, and they need oxygen. Because at least what cell I've got, let me just pack it with oxygen so that it will uh, help that situation. So there's sickle cell. Pernicious is the, is the other one I wanted to mention. Pernicious anemia sometimes called vitamin B12 deficiency. And I, I bring it out because it's, you, these are ones you do hear of. There's some other more obscure ones. But um, the pernicious is an in, intrinsic factor in your digestive system. It's not there and you just don't, it either left you or you never got it. Probably something happened to it, who would know? But you don't have the intrinsic factor which um, absorbs B12. That intrinsic factor in your gut, in your stomach, will absorb B12. So if you don't have it, B12 is just going out your system without absorbing. And it, the diagnosis of it, um, you know, somebody just is pallor, they're weak. They go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, you're definitely anemic. Let's try some food and da, 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 da. Because to find out if you've got pernicious anemia, it's kind of when nothing else is working, they say, well, we've got, it's diet isn't doing it. You're no better. So let's try the test. And the test is the Schillings test.
S C H. Is it S C H? S C H I L L I N G S. I think it's just so clever, uh, whoever thought of it. So they can, I mean, if you hadn't got the intrinsic factor, you're going to get B12 in a shot. The world takes care of us. So what they do, and I'm, I'm thinking it out, so help me. They're going to, day of testing, they're going to give you a whopping shot of B12, or let's say just a shot of B12. But then they're going to give you um, B12 in um, a, a tablet that has been um, um, tagged. It's B12, but it's got a, a, it's going to be able to be followed, tracked. So they give B12 in the mouth that has a tracking ability and they give you B12 here they put you on a 24-hour urine starting at 2 o'clock now you know we're gonna empty the urine <laughs> throw it away we're starting at 2 o'clock it's gonna go 24 hours collecting that urine if you don't have figured it out to make sure I'm telling it right. Y'all correct me, so follow me. If you don't have the intrinsic, if you have the intrinsic factor, that B12 you got in the capsule for tracking, or it may not even be need to be tracked, it's just B12, B12. So if you have the intrinsic, you're going to have a mother load of B12 in your urine. But if you don't have the intrinsic factor, you're just going to have a little bit of that that absorbed here. So that's the test, the shillings. Doesn't it make sense? On the video, he called it radioactive. Okay, so it, it does have a tracking, doesn't it? And the amount of B12 that should be in the urine. Now, um, so now did I say, wait a minute, I if said it shows wrong. up in the urine, it means you don't no. have it. Yeah, yeah that's what I meant to say. Right. Yeah. If, right? No, wait a minute. No, you're no. not absorbing it. On your video. Now, tell me. Uh -huh. It says if the 24 hour urine level is high, then you're negative. Yeah. You're okay. And then yes, you're that's low, what I'm, yeah. Then your test is positive. Right. If you've got the mother load, you don't have pernicious anemia. Because you absorbed it, and yeah, what happens to yeah? If you have the high amount in your urine, it absorbed and it absorbed, absorbed and absorbed. 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 Yeah, but if you don't have it, it's going to be a smaller amount because you just got it. And probably didn't even have any leftover to come in urine. What happened to the B12 tract? It went into the feces. Unless they just did the pill. Yeah. That's one of the same thing. Uh, because, um, now, let me think just a minute. I think, <coughs> well, because B12 doesn't absorb, it doesn't absorb in the GI. That's the whole point. It, you have no intrinsic factor. So are you going to even put out any B12 from the shot. Not really, because, yeah, if you put much, you might have a little B12 in the urine. No, you can't do B, that's the whole point. I can't eat B12, I can't do anything B12 because I don't have the intrinsic factor. What's happening to the B12 that I eat, it's going in feces. Would it show up in your lab work? Like if they check your B vitamins in your labs, would you be low or high? Why do they do urine? Um, for the B12 in the blood... Because as soon as they give that shot, your labs would be through the roof. Mm -hmm. We would yeah. have people come to the doctor's office and get their shot and then go get their labs. Yeah. And they're like, yeah. it would just be so high because they yeah. just got that shot. Okay. In your mm -hmm. blood. Yeah. Yeah. And that mm -hmm. doesn't prove if you've got that intrinsic factor mm -hmm. or not. Right, because you're not digesting. See, it doesn't go... Intrinsic factor is only dealing with the digestive system. Uh -huh. 
And um, so, you know, if you'll think about it, it's going to absorb and so much of it's left over, it's going in the urine. But if it's a low amount in the 24 hour, it's just what you got in a shot, if any, because the B12 radio opaque went into the feces. Do they do a blood test along with a urine test? Like, um, a, a blood test with the urine test. To test for the B12 in the blood. Mm -mm. And really, when you think about Linda, why? Because I know I've got it from the shot, but it do, I don't need to do it because the, the urine is going to tell me all of it. So you're saying if it if you do have intrinsic factor, it gets absorbed into uh -huh. your blood and then the leftover goes out in the urine. But if you don't have intrinsic factor, it's just going to automatically go out in the feces and nothing in the urine because it hasn't been absorbed first. Or you have a very little from this shot. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's probably the, the radioactive tag that's showing up high mm -hmm. in the urine yeah. because it's getting filtered. Once it gets with the intrinsic factor, mm -hmm. causes it to be absorbed into the blood and you and circulated, and then the and kidneys then are kidney filtering yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. that's why you yeah. can overdose on B12 mm -hmm. right. all those energy drinks and yeah. shots right. and all mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, yeah, that's how my brain is. Uh, <laughs> and, and then there's the folic acid deficiency, and that's just a DNA deficiency in the um, red cell. Well, uh, if, if a drink has 12 of B12, you, you said it doesn't absorb it. If you, if you don't have the intrinsic. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so you can eat all the B12 foods you want to, but it's not going to do a thing. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because you, it's going in the feces. Uh, and that's why you're anemic, is you're not absorbing. It's going in the blood. It's mm -hmm. blood needs. Yeah, yeah. Well, how do they get, how can uh, someone with that be treated with, like, B12 a shot? I had a friend, yeah, her son woke up paralyzed, basically. His B12 had dropped so low, he couldn't feel his legs. Oh, really? He couldn't walk. And then they just started, like, he got, like, hourly shots, and then they increased it, then he had to go to the office for daily, once he got feeling back in his legs. I guess it caused so much neuropathy. Um, uh-huh yeah Ooh. the only other right uh, aplastic anemia of course a is no plastic is growth so you it's it means no growth and it's a failure of the bone marrow for whatever reason the bone marrow is just not um, putting it out um, and and uh, there are others. And there's no reason for megoblastic uh, anemia. Don't. It's just um, the and hemolytic anemia. The the red cells membrane is not integritous. It's just weaker. It's not going to last 120. So it. The red cell dies. Those are some other anemias, and they, <coughs> as I said, the only one that you and I have much control of is diet. Um, now, for white blood cell problems, how are we, I'm going to keep on just a few more minutes. White blood cell, the biggest boo boo is leukemia and um, cancer of the blood. And you suspect it. Uh, I've seen some raging infections of over 30,000 of bacteria, but they get, if, you, if someone came in and was bruised all over and they had a 30,000 white cells, that's scary. Wait a minute. Clotting. We're, I thought we were talking white, and you're saying bruising. That's, that's platelets. But see, if uh, I'm pouring out, leukemia is, leuka is white, emia, 
white blood cells, but it's an enormous amount. And uh, you and I want five to 10,000. And I'm telling you, it's suspect when it gets much over 30,000 white blood cells. There are so many of them you say, well, that not that wonderful? No, it isn't because I take the example, best example I can think of, is you're making a, you batter with a mixer, and when you bring the mixer up, the batter is just all over the ceiling and everywhere. That's white blood cells. They're no form, there's nothing, but there's a lot of it, but they're of no use. And so, um, so because the bone marrow is pouring out all these 30,000, what happens to platelets and what red? They're not getting made because the bone marrow is so busy making white that it doesn't make enough red and, and, <coughs> and, and platelets. So because of that, I'm bruising. I don't have the sufficient number of platelets, but it's not a disease of platelets. It's only because my bone marrow is making so many white. So a leukemic comes in with high white, low platelets, and low red, but only because the bone marrow can't, can't do it all. Um, and normally those are blasts. Do the, what? The white blood cells, mm -hmm. they're immature mm -hmm. because yeah. they're making so many. So fast and worthless, <laughs> just worthless. Um, and, and of course you were, at, um, mm. you saw your, uh, plenty of that at mm. Le Bonheur. Thank you. Um, now, uh, it's going to, let me see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll tell you that in a minute. Um, so, you know, they're all, they're the four kinds, the acute, the chronic, the acute lymphocytic, the chronic lymphocytic, and all the four different kinds. There's no particular reason for you to learn them. Just know that some are chronic and some are acute. And and I think they've done a lot with leukemia. Uh, or, don't you? Yeah. Um, they've done a lot with it. Um, and, and I'm not sure what to say other than, and Christine might be able to say, um, they destroy, they try, their, for whatever reason, bone marrow has gotten off to a wild start. If they can calm it down by chemo, kill it, I mean injure almost the bone marrow to stop it. But in doing that, you're doing it, you're injuring everything. So chemo and I guess radiation are the answers if you can keep them healthy enough that when it's over, the bone marrow wakes back up and starts making cells. Can you say any more? Yeah, bone marrow transplant. Yeah. yeah, or stem cell. Mm -hmm. um, once you've gotten them down with no cells hardly, give them a stem cell, which are the babies, the baby cells that haven't decided what they're gonna be yet. Give them that or the bone marrow. I think they're having more progress with um, stem cell now than bone marrow because the stem cells haven't decided if they're platelet or what are they. They are blood cell, but which do they gonna be? If you get that transplant, then um, they're having some, some success, I think. Do and we I, know what turns that on at all? Do, on what? What turns the yeah, what, what whole makes it, process on? Christy may know, I mean, <laughs> you know, um, um, what's interesting is that they're, normally kids are about seven, six or seven when they get it. And if you get it around that age, it was always the weirdest thing. They would recover really well. That's what I was just asking. <clears throat> I don't know. But when, when they were adults. older or like a baby with it. Really? Isn't that bad. interesting? It was, it was weird. Hmm. Um, it seems like I had heard, and you know, you hear. Down syndrome kids get a lot. Do what? Down syndrome kids. Oh, do they really? Down mm -hmm. syndrome get it, get leukemia. Huh. Mm -hmm. um, there was one, it seemed like there was some theory 
Um, mm, I may think of it. I don't mention anything, do I, Melissa, in the film, how you get it. I mean, nobody knows. Well, I don't know that they really mm -mm. know, but I just um, Yeah, but there was there not much was even theories on it that I hear. But they don't think it's genetic? No, I'm, uh -uh. I don't think so. Mm -mm. I mean, out there right now is, uh, of course, one of them is your exposure to different chemicals Something that gets uh, to that like bone marrow. Um, chemotherapy for another cancer. Yeah. You're at risk for lymphoma or leukemia yeah. down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and it's usually about 20 years or more after your initial yeah. chemo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Seems like there's something Monday in my head of what the new idea of why you might get it. I can't think. Um, so, prognosis can be good, um, and, and that's an interesting thing Christy said on seven-year-old-ish versus... Don't quote me on that. No. That was just from me observing uh -huh. the kid yeah. there. Yeah, it is interesting because <clears throat> when you work with it, you do kind of observe. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say, too, it seemed like most of the breast cancer patients are the ones that would come back with leukemia or lymphoma. Oh, yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And, and I don't know how adju uh, adjuvant therapy is doing with, um, we'll talk about that in cancer, where they try to implant antibodies that will fight those things. And it's working in some of the cancers so well. Um, where you're, in, I think, well, the President Carter, he, he got that, um, the antibodies that attack, they, you know, some combinations, they found some antibodies that can attack certain cancers, which is the whole idea of immune system. Mm -hmm. and, and cancer certainly has broken that down. Um, now, Still along the lines of white blood cell problems are the lymphomas, the um, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. And they're tumors of the lymphatic system. And the lymphatic system is kind of associated with white or fighting. Uh, And tumors in the bone marrow uh, are quite painful. And that, that is multiple myeloma, myeloma, multiple myeloma. Um, if you hear the term CRAB, C-R-A-B, C stands for um, calcium, R for renal insufficiency, A for anemia, and B for bone lesions or tumors. And um, a biopsy would indicate um, a diagnosis. Um, if you're, you know, I don't know how much, and I don't think I'll spend much more on the lymphomas and the um, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's. Just know they're tumors, and um, some have, have gotten so large they just are debunked, just made smaller, and some um, can be reduced to a certain extent. Moving on to platelets problem. Let's do that, that real quick. Um, um, I 
the probably the two most famous and they're there have been around enough. I've nursed a few, a few of ITP, uh, idiopathic, which is, means strange as it may seem, idiopathic thrombocytopenia, low platelets, purpura, ITP. Um, it's just that one day. You know, these blood problems are so strange because they do just come up. But just one day, and it's typically among college-aged kids, um, you just wake up and you feel flu-like, flu-like symptoms. And what really takes you to the <coughs> gory health with ITP is you're just fatigued and you just don't feel like walking across campus. It happens so much on college campuses. Um, and you're... But when you go in, they notice your bruising. And that's your low platelets. That's not a good sign. Everybody's a little upset. They take the blood work, complete blood count, and platelets, and they see that your platelets are low, but your hemoglobin and white, I mean hematocrit hemoglobin and white are okay. Well that's the best news because you know we know it's not leukemia but it sure is a problem with your platelets rupturing and so <clears throat> then they check more and realize that you do have idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura which is um, it's a it's just crazy. One day you wake up and the body says to itself, I don't believe I recognize these platelets and I think I need to kill them. And so what happens is the body makes an antibody to kill this, well, what happens, yeah, this cell. And, but it's a parasitic kind of antibody and it rides on top of it. And the interesting thing to me is the platelet still works. And if it would be left alone, that antibody doesn't bother the platelet. The platelet's working fine until it goes through the spleen. And the whole point of our wonderful spleen system is that anything that looks doesn't look like a cell that it should, they'll get killed. And so that platelet gets killed because it doesn't look right. And so when that young 20 year old went to a doctor because they felt so bad and they saw the bruising, but they read the blood work, then they just put the hands on the stomach and you can feel the big old spleen because the spleen has been killing and killing and now it's huge. And you say, I wouldn't know a spleen. No, you wouldn't and I wouldn't either, but I sure can feel a basketball in there if I did it. If I don't feel anything, well, it's not, maybe it's real early or something. Because, yeah, you and I probably don't know where the spleen, but we would if a bit was. So the spleen just gets bigger and bigger with the old, destroyed platelets. Um, I heard another treatment earlier. The first thing they try is steroids. Do you remember in, when we, I had you look up steroids on your briefs? <clears throat> One of the first things it said is it coats, um, coats platelets. Um, I think I'll find that for you. Um, it, it's on page 21 <coughs> of your briefs, and it says steroids do the following: coat platelets so spleen won't kill them. So the physician. They cross their fingers and give you steroids. But now we don't want that too long because we're going to get the buffalo neck and the chipmunk face. And our skin's going to get thin, and so we can't be on them long. So it doesn't take the physician long to see if we're tricking the spleen because it literally oils that peculiar platelet and lets it just slide on through supposed to. 
It's worked, but whether it'll work this time, who knows? It's not, let's say it's not. If it is, that's great. We'll let you stay on steroids a few weeks and then take you off and hope it works. Is that not just peculiar? It wakes up one day and just says, this doesn't belong to me and I need to get rid of it. Anyway, then another thing is, um, they are now, what we've been doing on the floor is giving an antibody that um, tries to kill that antibody. So antibodies can be infused to try to kill that and not kill the, the platelet's fine. It's just that antibody. So antibodies may be used to try to kill the antibody. Um, and then nothing else working then um, splenectomy. Even though our spleen is fine and we appreciate what it's done, it's us in trouble because it, it um, is, is um, killing our platelets. And if we take it out and we live with that, and as silly as ITP starts, that's the reason it's called idiopathic, it's gone. One day you just quit doing that. So um, um, if, you, if low platelets don't kill you, if you can live through the, the um, extent of ITP, it just leaves you. Um, so the antibodies just go away? Mm -hmm. It just quits, quits one day, just as peculiarly as it started. Um, now, there is a, one more treatment I heard the other day. I hadn't done it, but it was another treatment I heard for ITP. Oh, yeah. No, I thought I had it. Um, and you might, if you've got time at home, look it up and see the, new, the newest treatment in ITP. Um, I did want to tell you, when you see a capital I, lowercase g, and then another letter, C, B, whatever. So capital I, little g, and an E, it can be a capital, it can be a small. That is an antibody um, infusion. IgE, IgA, but it's listed you saw that, capital I, little g, and some other letter, you automatically know, ooh, that's an antibody. So I'm getting ready to give infusion of antibodies. Um, this one is not, put TTP, and it's thrombo, um, thromb, thrombo, thrombolytic thrombocytopenia. The T is thrombo. And um, this one, um, and it's rare, it's more rare. Um, platelets clog together. Thrombolytic thrombo. They clog together uh, like that. And that's not gonna fly. The spleen's going to get it or the kidneys are going to stop it. I mean, that is not going to work, a big clumps of, um, of platelets. So they're non-functioning, and that makes our platelets low. So you, uh, The interesting thing, the treatment for that are anticoagulants. Um, hemophilia, another illness and that's just you just don't have you know, we have 13 clotting factors and two of them are gone we just didn't get them in the creation uh, I do want to say von Willebrand von v-o-n Willebrand they miss one one clotting factor it's not as severe as um, hemophilia and if you've ever read um, Nicholas and Alexander of, the, of, of Russia, um, you know, the heir apparent was eight years old and he had a hemophilia. And the story of him really puts you, if you've never 
thought much about hemophilia because you know just a bump and it's um, it, it bleeds in your joint and the pain involved this summer and I'm still a little astounded this summer the counselor at my boys camp so he sophomore junior in college and in our refrigerator in the clinic were factors age factor or whatever and he's a hemophiliac. He's out helping the boys and everything. Well built, well defined. And I just saw his history that he's an, a hemophiliac. And um, so I went, the, one of the weekends we weren't here, I went back up to camp for father's son weekend to be the nurse that weekend. And he had pain. He was back just for the weekend from college, this same fellow. And he had horrible pain in his, um, it was, it was abdomen, but it was higher. And so he came to the clinic waiting on his father to come to pick him up because he was in terrible, he said, I was crying last night. So we're, I visited with him a little bit about his hemophilia and he acts so normal, and he's had it, of course, since birth. And so he, sports have been very uh, um, choice selective because, you know, he, not that he wanted to play football, but he never would have. We didn't discuss football. Um, he's, and he's pretty active physically. He said that the mental, and that's what I would think. The mental, he said, fortunately I've never been accident prone, but there is a lot of stress. And, and he doesn't act like he's stressed. And I thought it was interesting he shared that. He said, the stress is just, I have to work on that. For, and I think so. Anyway, um, I didn't, they will tell me about one of your <laughs> that's where you <laughs> bled in your joint or whatever. Von Willebrand doesn't have the two, you're just missing one. And um, um, it, um, they don't bleed in the joints. Um, like there was something else I was going to say. I guess that's all I was going to say. It's just not as bad. Um, I was going to say something. The only, I want to remind you that penia, P-E-N-I-A, uh, which is, as on, on the end of a word, is low, so thrombocytopenias, clot cell low. Uh, ptosis, T-O-S-I-S, -S, is an increase. So thrombocytosis is a high amount of, of, of uh, platelets. Erythrocytosis, high amount of red cells. Um, now, I want to do, um, I want to talk about DIC, disseminated and then we'll break. Disseminated intravascular coagulation, you don't need to know what it stands for, disseminated intravascular coagulation, coagulation. And um, It's just as peculiar as any of the others. When does it ever come up? And nobody knows. Um, we don't know why it does it, but it. the best way I can describe it, and this, I made this up myself, if I've not been around Amish people, but I've seen movies and read books, <laughs> but when you consider an Amish farm, a Mennonite area, and there's a catastrophe or a house is on fire or something need help, they ring a bell. And every able-bodied, as far as physical, 
drop their shovels and run to that bell ringing. The women and children stay back. Don't get in the way. Only people that can probably help with an emergency go. And um, they all get up there to help. Well, to me, that's a little bit like DIC because DIC, there's an incident and everything that is everybody rushes to that spot. The trouble with when they get there, they're all over each other and they're not too effective. And we've got clotting, we've got a mess, but guess what happened back at the farm? Just the children and the women. And so they're defenseless and the wolves and the Indians come. <laughs> wolves and the Indians come to them and they're defenseless, so they're bleeding out. So DIC is clotting and bleeding at the same time. Now, how can that be? Well, it's just an odd thing. It's bleeding and clotting at the same time. And which is worse? Is it worse to clot or is it worse to bleed? And um, um, the treatment is an anticoagulant. Well, I tell you, uh, uh, we had a patient that was pregnant and during her pregnancy, mm -hmm. when she delivered, it happened to her. Fingers, mm -hmm. fingers, breast, buttocks, toes, uh, gone. And uh, wound care out the wazoo. You had to you had to medicate her to get her the, the dress. Did she lose them? Mm -hmm. mm. She lost breast. Uh, I mean, it really? Was a, she's never been able to, she was never able to hold her child. That's how awful it How'd she live? Uh, how long did she live? Did she live? Well, I don't know because after how? a while I, I didn't continue to care for her. But it was just, <clears throat> excuse me, it was that period of time. Yeah, because if you're if you're bleeding, you're not getting oxygen. If you're clotted, you're not getting oxygen. Well, she wasn't. She was stabilized by the time. Yeah, yeah. But, oh no. You know, just to see the damage had been done. Right. The, the, the amputations had to be done. You know. Really? Just, Did you say anything? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it it happens a lot. Uh, I mean, it it is kind of rare that you see it, but with pregnancy, it has. Pregnancy, I've. I've been to the hospital when I supervise, and I've, I'll go in sometimes in the delivery room just because I want to, and they'll say she's DIC, and, and she's, she's bleeding. Mm -hmm. But they, I've not seen any bad result because they pour the, the blood to them. So, you know, I say the treatment's anticoagulant. It's not for somebody bleeding out, which these, women are bleeding you, out. You almost have to do both at the same time, which is, it's such a yeah. balance. A balance. Mm -hmm. yeah. And pregnancy, mm -hmm. it, it's, it is bleeding and clotting, mm -hmm. but it is a different bag than you and I, who aren't pregnant and delivering. DIC is a little bit different. It's still bleeding and clotting. Treatment is, a, as, as, um, as it was, the whole, um, the whole thing is it's it's that balance mm -hmm. between the anticoagulant and the blood spot. You and I, they start with anticoagulant. You're very and, emergent. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's there mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. When it's when it's happening and constant lab work, constant. Yeah. yeah. Um. Now, you've heard that part of their pregnancy deal, and I've been experienced one, and it well, he wasn't, he wasn't pregnant. Um, it was the emergency room in Dallas, and oh, it, it wait, let me just say, um, gram-negative rods, the, the gram-negative bacteria can cause flip. It just can. You can have it and not go into DIC, but he does and he does. Um, what causes DIC? Nobody knows. Um, 
blood loss can. That is usually what's triggering pregnant women is they're losing so much blood. That's usually the identified women reason with women. With regular people, it's so it can be blood loss, and you know an accident, a car accident or something, a gunshot wound can cause it, but also the gram negative rod. And so I was working in an emergency room in Dallas, and a Sunday morning. Um, Sunday mornings in a big emergency room are very quiet because they've had a huge night and things are calm. And um, I think I told you in my emer in the emergency room at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, they'd have a doctor, nurse, and tech in every area of the emergency room. And, and the emergency room was uh, major medicine, diabetes and stuff, major surgery where gunshot wounds or, di or appendicitis or whatever. OB, psych, pediatrics, and um, minor medicine, minor surgery. And you had a doctor, nurse, and tech in each area, every shift. And so I was in um, um, minor medicine, <coughs> I think it was. Minor, um, minor medicine that Sunday morning. And the um, just cleaning up because nobody's there. Doctors reading the paper and drinking coffee, and the tech and I are kind of straightening up and stuff. He and so in comes a 19 year old who just flu like symptoms. Um, also, you came in the morning to that emergency room and found out where you worked, and I did love it because you, you. You go everywhere and learn something about every place. And then you're, you can work on the, tri or she assigns you to the triage desk, which she questions where to take you or send you. So he was sent to us because flu-like symptoms, fever, felt terrible, felt terrible. And so we put him in a cubicle and I did his vitals and I think his temperature was like 99. So it wasn't, wasn't remarkable. So I did his temp, gave him a blanket, and then took the sheet of paper to the physician, and he's drinking his coffee. He says, what is it? I said, well, he's flu-like. His temp was da-da-da. So he finished the newspaper and finished his coffee and went in there and then came out to me, and he said, give him some Tylenol. He said, he's... he's I don't think he, he wasn't homeless. He had left home, not, I don't think, mad or anything. He was just traveling on his thumb, uh, just out around. And um, he said, let's let him sleep. Give him a pillow and let's let him stay because we're not busy. And he's on the street. Not on the street. He was, spent the night at the bus, <coughs> bus station, I think. And so I did. And, um, and I continued my cleaning and in came the um, head nurse. And um, I wasn't there with Kennedy, but she, William Manchester describes her as the great white starch dragon. And she, <laughs> she was big and wore white starch. So she came through and she said, y'all got anything going? I said, well, just, just that. And you could see through the, cur the break in the curtain and she and I both saw his coloring, and he was dusky. And so we both saw it and went straight to him. And he was not conscious. He, he, we couldn't get his attention. So then, as you said, everything broke. And you could see um, petechia. DIC will, will start with petechia, and then they go together. In front of your eyes, the petechia makes a birthmark. And um, so it was doing it. We knew he was DIC. -ing. They had him um, um, in the fetal position with a LP in his back, and it was just milk when they took it out. And he was dead in 20 minutes. They put they put um, sulfur. Uh, um, I want to say sulfur. Again, uh, no. What is it? Yeah, it's sulfur, I guess. 
to try to help slow it down or something, but he was dead. And they hadn't drawn labs, they hadn't done cultures at that point or anything. Uh -uh. Because he was just flu, just the flu. And scary. Yeah, it is scary. And um, what was so interesting, I kind of downplay the physician with his coffee and newspaper, but I mean, there was, what else did he need to be doing? But he did get a good history. Um, and it's to me fascinating. Of course, it was the gram negative got him, but why and how? Mm -hmm. And so sudden. Well, the physician got the story as, as brief as it was. Three days ago, he was in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, this is Dallas, and at the bus station, he had an altercation with somebody who hit him in the face and um, so I guess maybe bled a little or whatever. And so it obviously crusted, but he was smart enough not to pick it because his no, he knew his nose would bleed. But then he um, is in Dallas, I guess the third night later, and either gets rid of the crust, but the bacteria got into his bloodstream. And so that's what killed him. Um, I mean, it's just crazy. What a crazy, crazy. So were the gram negative rods found on autopsy, or how did they figure that out? They knew that it wasn't blood loss, so it had to be gram negative. And so, of course, they drew blood as he's dying and getting the LP and all that. Mm -hmm. um, another incident of. of uh, DIC with the gram negative and see it, it is crazy because you don't know but you also don't know who's going to bleed out or not because all the deliveries as you say it's common but it's not common mm -hmm. and you're exactly right you you can't be a, a labor nurse and not see it at some point but I at camp the camp I'm, I go to um, I think, I, I don't know how old I was, 46 maybe, and she was 26, my second nurse, and she had just gotten her master's at Vanderbilt, she lived, but she'd just gotten her master's at Vanderbilt, and she told me she was just coming off of um, DIC, and what happened to her was she's doing her master's, she, um, she, um, not, what is that? Not uh, anorexic, um, bo bulimia. Mm -hmm. She, of course, you know, they're never very skinny, but um, anorexics are. Well, she had an eating disorder. And um, she, so, so let's just put it this way, her eating was not good. So her nutrition, wasn't good. she looked good. She looked real good. But you know, bulimics a lot of times do. And so, she said that um, she got a blister on her foot. So she went to Vanderbilt's uh, health, student health, and he gave her antibiotics. Well, you know, she's not, she doesn't eat good. And if you're on antibiotics, you need a little something with that in your stomach. She said, I took them three days and it cleared up. Um, my leg cleared up because it had been streaking up. So in three days of antibiotics. So I'm sure it was not fun to take them. She's got exams. She's, you know, sleep deprivation. And we got on antibiotics w with not eating very good either. So she quit them and got through exams and all that. Got her drive home to Maryville. And she said, she got an hour or so out, hour and a half out of Maryville. And she said, I couldn't go any longer. She, her fever spiked again. And um, she said, I knew I couldn't make it. So she called her parents and her parents came to get her at I-40 someplace. Took her home and she said, I got in bed because I didn't think I needed to go to the doctor. I knew what it was. I'd just go tomorrow and get antibiotics. And she fitfully slept, but 
woke up and thought, I'm sick, I'm bad sick, and I need to get to a doctor. So she said, I couldn't even walk to my parents' bedroom. I crawled, and when my stepfather saw me, he said, let's go. And he got her and to go and take her to a doc in the box because he knew it didn't look good. He wasn't medical, but apparently she said she was splotchy. She, well, that was, mm -hmm. that was, that was the uh, petechiae, that was the DIC. And she said, I owe my life to my stepfather because we got to the clinic, the doc in the box, and it wasn't open yet. It was before nine o'clock. And I said, I can just lay here and wait. And he said, no, they went to the emergency room. And well, they got scolded. And if you ever work emergency room, you know, and I did, so I know, and I tried not to do it. I don't, I don't <laughs> think I did it because I couldn't stand it. You are, you do feel put out with nothings that come into an emergency room. You do that, that's just a human feeling. We've got a gunshot wound and you come in with this and you're irritated, we're not seeing you. But she said, um, they got scolded because it looked like a, she just doesn't feel good. She's high fever. She doesn't look good. She doesn't feel good. Why did, don't you have a doctor? Yes. You know, it's that kind of thing. They were real put out with it until they did blood work. And she said her WBCs were like 40,000. Now they look at her and she's splotchy. She's got 40,000. So they're pretty sure it looks like leukemia. And so, um, and especially 40,000 WBCs. So they, she said, I was upstairs in seconds. And she said that they had a hematologist in doing an LP on me before I, the door of the elevator closed. And she said, the last I remember is he held it up and it was just like milk. And now she lived, but it was because she got to a good doctor and at a good time and and so forth so it's it's just a crazy crazy um happening that nobody knows a warning for just no warning um, just with all that being said the oncologist i used to work for he he told me he said and to always remember this anytime a patient comes in and they say they do not feel good or they feel like they're going to die you need to take it very seriously and just did he really? Yeah. Isn't that good? Yeah. Uh huh. And I remember one lady came in and she just kept saying, I don't feel like I'm going to die. And I got you know, him in there and he's just going to admit her, just with what she's saying. We didn't, and she was dead in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. She had a GI um, rupture, uh -huh. abscess, or something. She just, See? Yeah. Isn't that good? Yeah.